Joseph Gardner says, has anyone successfully bought a quad off of Amazon? I usually shop Pyrodrone, but I have a gift card for Amazon, so it's my only option. Yeah, I mean, uh, just pay attention to who you're buying from. If you buy from a legitimate store instead of a third-party seller, you'll usually have fine results. If you buy from an actual Amazon like warehouse, Amazon fulfilled by Amazon will have a lot of protection. Whereas uh, if you're buying from a third-party seller, you get it's a little harder to make a return. But in general, a lot of times FPV stuff is more expensive on Amazon. Is the other thing. So you should cross price. You should comparison shop it against other stores and make sure you're getting a good deal. <clears throat> Um, Claymore FPV, very interesting. Do you think a 4K action camera would be a good addition to the 7-inch Street League spec to help drive content and grow drone racing in general? Uh, Claymore, I have made the argument in the past. It's funny that you say that. A long, long time ago, I argued that one of the ways to grow five inch drone racing was to require pilots to carry a GoPro. So that, and, and if pilots say, well, we can't afford a GoPro, then to require them to carry a dummy weight of equivalent weight to a GoPro, so there's no competitive disadvantage. But hopefully it would uh, encourage there to be more high quality footage of racing. And if everyone was required to do it, then it wouldn't uh, disadvantage people. Of course, no one did that. Racers don't want to do that. And I'm not sure I was right, you know. Um, the question is, is bad video quality what is stopping people from wanting to get into Street League? And I don't know if that's the, that's the thing that's stopping them from wanting to get into Street League. I think anytime you require pilots to add an expensive piece of kit to their uh, aircraft, there's going to be pushback. Then again, the street league rigs already require pilots to put a bunch of expensive stuff. The, the quads themselves are, it's a spec league. So I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And people are going to break them a lot. So... I don't think that lack of high definition footage is what's holding Street Lake back, would be my my thought. Fire Falcon says, uh, beginner here, how do I know when to transition from the sim to flying for real? Um, Fire Falcon, in my opinion, when you can take off, fly around, go and and then mostly sort of land the quad where you intend to land it without getting out of control, that's the minimum standard for when you can go to the real quad. The thing that happens is that beginners get out of control and don't know how to get back in control and then they crash. And that's what you don't want to be doing with a real quad, okay? Um, so you don't have to be able to do fancy tricks or, or run a race course, but what you have to be able to do is judge when you are at the edge of your capability envelope and stay within that to be able to recover from the quad kind of getting a little destabilized to go where you need to go and so on. Have you ever flown with two cameras so you can see in stereo? Uh, no, Doug Hoffer. Um, if you look hard enough, there have been stereo FPV systems in existence. In my experience, nobody used them, and and they didn't sell, and there were very few of them. And now I'm I'm not even sure you can still get them. Um, they were analog only. I've never known of a digital uh, stereo FPV system, and uh, you gave up. Well, that's not true. The SkyZone one used dual transmitters. So the SkyZone system, if my memory is correct, had dual video transmitters, which transmitted on two channels, one for the left and one for the right eye, which was the best way to do it, but used twice as much bandwidth. The other ones would do either a vertical split or every other scan line split left and right. 
Uh, and of course, the goggles had to support putting, you know, splitting the signal apart like that. Um, but you had half resolution to each eye. Uh, the cameras typically were a single piece and the spacing between the cameras was fixed. And uh, I don't know why it didn't take off, but, you know, the, it never took off. And I've never done it, to answer your question directly. Is two forty nine a good price for a Hero 10? I don't know. What's a new one go for? A new Hero... Well, well <laughs> GoPro is selling it for 250 bucks. So, I mean, that's... <laughs> that's what GoPro is asking. The question is, do you want a Hero 10? What's a Hero 12 going for? 500 probably, right? 400. That's interesting. I mean, I'll tell you what. I've seen some really impressive uh, pictures. I've seen some really impressive pictures from the Hero 12. Uh, the HDR stuff is pretty impressive. Um, 250 is, I mean, that's just what it's going for. So if you don't like that, if you like that price, go for it. Um, GoPro is pretty good at sort of spacing out their pricing. So you've got Hero 10, 11, 12, you know, uh, and they, they're going to price them competitively with each other. Just decide which one you want. What smoke stopper do you like? I like the V fly short saver V2. That's the one I like. V-Fly Short Saver V2. Yep. Uh, you don't have to buy it from Amazon. That was just the first link that came up. Um, I like that it's got a power switch. I like that it has both XT30 and XT60 plugs, so you can actually use it as a converter if you want. Uh, just a really, really useful piece of kit, and I'm a big fan of it. Is there... So the second half of that question is, I have an old bulb one I made, but I wonder if the new electronics are more useful. How do you feel about that? Well, I like the fact... So the bulb one doesn't really have controllable cu current threshold. And the other thing is it limits the current, but it doesn't cut off the current. So there are cases where that will be a good thing. On the bulb ones, if you, like, arm the quad, the voltage will drop, but it won't, like, cut out. And so you could still kind of maybe arm and idle, whereas on the on the short saver style where they have an electric fuse, basically as soon as you cross the threshold, they just cut off and you have to power cycle. So there are times when the bulb ones are are desirable, but I I haven't used a bulb one in a long time. Uh, I just trust the e fuse ones, and uh, I find their positives to outweigh their negatives. How do you make it not trip when the motors start beeping? Right, exactly. So it, it has adjustable current threshold. You could change it from one amp to two amp, and that will usually let the motors beep. But if your motor beeps are tripping it, even on two amps, there's now you're now you're like, well, I wish I had a light bulb. <laughs> 